schedules for the weekend now. Uh, so just a few announcements to start off with. Um, just uh, I think I've checked in with everybody. Uh, so uh, we'll have looks like five projects. So uh, the space downstairs is cleared. Plus we have the yoga room for extra if we need it. So it should be good. Three jump mats, vibration platform, force plate, balance unit, uh, everything going at once. So uh, Dr. Schaefer doesn't have any thesis students going tomorrow, which should help uh, with congestion. Um, so I think we should should be good. Uh, so in the, uh, I'll be there uh, early tomorrow, about 7.30 to just check in, get everything turned on, calibrated, and uh, and then we'll go till about three o'clock. So, uh, and then Tuesday I have um, uh, Haley and Corey and Jackie uh, for those three. So, uh, for today, hey Carson, uh, for today um, the class will be in three parts. So, uh, under the folder uh, for this week. Um, for today's uh, class specifically, we'll have uh, three different parts, contrasting perspectives uh, on literature, so pulling uh, some uh, opposing viewpoints, looking at one body of literature, but uh, coming out with somewhat contrasting uh, messages, which is very similar in any field. You have uh, scientists that have uh, differing viewpoints, so I wanted to bring out three uh, just three examples, three cases of that. Um, one is relevant to uh, epidemiology. Hi. Um, and then uh, chapter 17, uh, we'll go through part B of that. Uh, and then chapter 18, um, we'll get into part A of that one. So uh, if you want to have, um, there's one class activity associated with uh, chapter 17. Uh, if you have that pulled up and, and ready, That'd be great. So. Okay. So before we get into the first example, um, I want to just review what a relative risk is. So relative risk, sometimes called the hazard ratio. So uh, it's the ratio of people that have a condition uh, versus a reference group. So there's usually a reference group that has a ratio of 1.0. And then if you have another group that has a ratio higher than that, that means there's an increased risk of a certain condition. Uh, if you have a group that is less than the reference group, so less than 1.0, uh, that means decreased risk. So in a few of the quotes today and in some of the material from uh, part B of chapter 17, uh, there'll be some uh, risk ratios. Uh, that you'll have to interpret and we'll, we'll talk about. Okay, so contrasting perspectives uh, of the body of literature, examples from health and human performance. Let's go to this one to start with. Um, so this uh, came out January of 2019. So after 40 years of epidemiological research on physical activity, you have two groups of scientists in different laboratories at different universities uh, that have somewhat opposing viewpoints um, in terms of the direction public health emphasis should go to help people in our country be more healthy. Um, so this was uh, Glenn Gasser and Stephen Blair from Arizona State University, a uh, well-respected in institution. Uh, Stephen Blair was also the lead scientist for the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Research. So after Dallas, Texas, he went to South Carolina uh, and then also uh, was working at Arizona State. So uh, very well known and respected. So he's the physical activity guy. He's all about the physical activity emphasis. Um, so just a couple of key quotes from that one. Um, a moderate to high level of cardiorespiratory fitness. So abbreviated CRF attenuates or eliminates mortality risk associated with the high body mass index. So based on a lot of his research, especially what we talked about from uh, chapter 17, uh, the risk of mortality as well as other uh, comorbidities such as coronary artery disease, uh, diabetes, 
myocardial infarction, the risk of those things is significantly attenuated uh, with a moderate to even high level of cardiorespiratory fitness, independent of uh, body size. Uh, so point number two, a metabolically healthy obese phenotype diminishes risk associated with a high BMI. So when these authors talk about metabolically healthy, it's all about things that are in the blood. So there's, there's something called metabolic syndrome. How many have heard of that, metabolic syndrome? So it's a, it's a cluster of conditions uh, that increases risk for type 2 diabetes as well as coronary artery disease. So uh, generally includes things like high blood pressure, high blood glucose, high blood cholesterol, and then lots of fat uh, in the abdominal region. So a, a waist circumference greater than 102 centimeters. Um, so that cluster of conditions, this metabolic syndrome, seems to be particularly potent for uh, increasing risk of type 2 diabetes, especially, hey Jackie, due to insulin resistance and then coronary artery disease. Okay, so number three, removal of body fat may not improve cardiometabolic health. And so, and then the fourth point, data on intentional weight loss mortality does not support the conventional wisdom that high BMI itself is the primary cause of obesity-related health conditions. So, given those four points, their overall quote was, we are not arguing that obesity is entirely benign, nor do we contend that we should be complacent about obesity or ignore it. Instead, we emphasize that treatment, if warranted, be non-weight loss centered with a focus on improving healthy behaviors. So, the weight loss is secondary to other health benefits that um, you'd be getting uh, from changing, changing behavior. So that's, that's their whole emphasis. Um, so with that quote, they had several key quotes here. So we urge healthcare professionals to promote the benefits of a healthier lifestyle, independent of weight loss and inspire patients, underlying there to focus on physical activity. So whether or not the weight comes off or not, the focus is more on the behavior, increasing physical activity, reducing insulin resistance. So here's where they bring in a few hazard ratios. So remember 1.0 is the reference group. So the fact that the hazard ratio for unfit normal weight individuals, so we're talking about a normal BMI but with a low level of cardiorespiratory fitness, the hazard ratio was 2.42. So what that says is there's 142% greater risk. So a hazard ratio of two would be twice the risk, right? So 100% more risk. So 142% greater risk than those associated with fit, overweight, and fit, obese. So those that were fit and overweight or fit, obese had relative risk of 1.13 and 1.21. So how much increased risk would 1.13 and 1.21 be? There's still an increased risk, but how much? Yeah, yeah, that's right, 13% and 21%. So according to their data, it's not so much about body size, but it's about the fitness that reduces uh, mortality risk. So, and remember, uh, their fitness levels are not unachievable. Everybody can achieve a level of between 35 and 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And as I look over this room and had some of you in exercise physiology, you were all above that criteria. So we can all achieve that no matter what our uh, current condition is. So another one here, even acknowledging the report showing a benefit of weight loss, the reduced mortality risk is approximately 15 to 18%. So when we look at weight loss independently, the reduced risk of mortality is this percentage. Um, for, for context, improving cardiorespiratory fitness has been reported to be associated with a 35 to 59% reduction in all-cause mortality risk. So yes, loss of weight does help, okay, but loss of weight along with improvements in your fitness level helps a lot more, more than double. Uh, the benefit in reducing risk. 
Okay, so that's part one. All right, so that's one side, okay? But here's the other side, Dukizik. Dukizik at the University of Pittsburgh. So they take the counter approach, health risks of obesity have not been exaggerated. So let's see what uh, their argument is. So they start out their article by pointing out some statistics that are true, okay? So the overall prevalence of obesity increased in adults from 30.5% in 1999 to 2000 to 37.7% in 2013 and 2014. That's a percentage that is still going up today. Okay, so it's the public uh, guideline, the physical activity guidelines for Americans haven't done much to slow that rate of progression. So we're kind of at a crossroads. What can we do to slow down this disturbing trend. So of additional concern is the prevalence of class three obesity. So greater than 40 kilograms per meter squared with data from 2013 to 2014 demonstrating a prevalence of 5.5% in men and 9.9% for women. So starting out their article, just uh, citing some stats on the current state of affairs. So, one of the one of the best points, hey Jordan, one of the best points that they make uh, from their article um, is that a lot of the studies by Blair and colleagues didn't look at people in that class three, so people with severe obesity. So one of their key points, and it's I think it's a great point, is that people that have that body size, it's gonna be really tough for them to sustain a moderate to high level of cardiorespiratory fitness. So this population, their point, this population was lacking in a lot of the studies that, that were done by Blair. So then they bring up a lot of uh, different uh, health conditions, such as coronary artery disease, uh, cancer, um, they bring up this one. So for, for example, evidence from a registry of patients with stable coronary artery disease indicated that patients with obesity had greater mortality risk. Okay, so showing a hazard ratio of 1.12. So that'd be how much increased risk then? Be 12%, right? And then the 95% confidence interval. So what does that mean? We're 95% sure that the hazard ratio is between these limits, right? So we've, we've talked about that. So cancer as well in patients with cancer, there is also evidence that higher BMI is associated with greater likelihood of reoccurrence and poorer survival. So also a true point. Uh, type two diabetes was also brought in, um, showing that uh, weight loss was associated with several important benefits. So people with diabetes um, resulted here at the bottom lower use, lower use of antihypertensive medication. So that's good. Okay, so blood pressure medication goes down, statins, another blood pressure medication, and insulin. Okay, so they're not taking as much insulin. Their their muscle cells are getting more sensitive to insulin, so they're able to more effectively uh, metabolize glucose. So I think that's another important point. Uh, one of the, the key points, and they, they come to this towards the end of the article, um, one of the things that Blair doesn't talk about is physical function. So um, in his research, there's a high emphasis on cardiorespiratory fitness, but that doesn't take into account other measures of function. So weight loss is associated with other things, um, such as reducing, um, obesity is also associated with higher prevalence of depression, greater levels of body dissatisfaction and sleep disorders. So those are things, as well as um, carrying extra weight is hard on your joints, right? So there's a greater, greater amount of compression and shear force, which would increase risk of osteoarthritis. So wearing down of cartilage in the joints um, would be associated with carrying a lot of uh, excess weight. So 
Older adults' obesity is associated with poor balance and mobility. This poor physical performance may be due to the negative influence of obesity on the joints of the body. Okay, so two sides of it. What do you think? Where's the truth usually? In the middle. In the middle. That's exactly right. That's the best philosophy to take. So physical activity is great, but for lots of other reasons, we would also want to decrease the weight as well. So both things are important, but obviously they ask people that have done a lot of research in one area or the other to uh, write articles to present both sides. So, um, so that's, that's the first one. Um, so number two, uh, abdominal crunches are or are not a safe and effective exercise. So how many read this one? So how well does the spine of a pig resemble the spine of a human? So testing uh, spines of a pig, so a porcine spine with a certain number of flexion and extension cycles. And so what these experiments have shown is that if you put a spine through a certain number of flexion and extension cycles, guess what happens to discs? They wear out, right? Do discs ever wear out in humans? Yes, but maybe not uh, to the same degree as what we're talking about here. So how well you can apply this research to humans is, is questionable, in my opinion. So um, the crunch has a limited range of movement that works the spine nowhere close to its end range flexion capacity and thus results in much less stress on the discs. So another, another key point here, spinal tissue in living humans adapts to stress of progressive exercise by getting stronger and thus can withstand greater stress over time. I think with, with humans, especially in occupational jobs, um, Regardless of how your back feels, do you still have to go to work? Yeah, so that kind of creates a situation where your tissues aren't getting sufficient recovery, right? So you're working an eight hour shift at FedEx and then you go home and then you don't have very much longer if you have to go do it again, right? So there's not as much recovery where you, your tissues have time to adapt and get stronger. So, in contrast to the many thousands of repeated flexion and extension cycles, typical, so he's referring to the, the tests on the pig spine there. Typical abdominal strengthening protocols involve a fraction of these repetitions. So I think uh, that's a valid point as well. So then he goes in and, and uh, points out three advantages of the crunch. So spinal flexion promotes nutrient delivery. So nutrient delivery is important. Movement is important, okay, because the discs have a very poor blood supply, so that's important. Uh, dynamic spinal flexion, strength and power is relevant to many sports, is his next point, okay? So, yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, and then performance of the crunch may promote greater abdominal muscle hypertrophy. So if you're really looking for that nice six-pack with a little bit of mass in there, then a loaded crunch might be indicated. Um, he does uh, point out at the, at the very end of his point that it seems prudent those with existing spinal conditions, including disc herniation, disc prolapse, and or flexion intolerance avoid performance of dynamic spinal flexion exercises. So basically just coming down, yeah, there are some benefits, but um, you have to look at the context. So if the individual has a history, then it's probably prudent to steer away and go with a more static type of exercise for the, for the anterior core. Okay, so the counterpoints, basically just talking about uh, the risk of disc herniations. So what's the direction of most herniations? If somebody herniates a disc, we're talking about an outer fibrous layer and an inner layer called the, the nucleus pulposus. It's kind of like a gelatin type substance. So if you're, if you're flexing at the spine, most of the pressure is in the back. So posterior disc herniations, posterior induced migration of the nucleus pulposus, that's where you're going to have most 
of your disc herniations and then pressure on those peripheral nerve roots. Um, so it would be erroneous to assume that everyone who does an abdominal crunch will develop disc pathology. So I think that's an important point, just common sense. Just because you do crunches doesn't mean you're automatically doomed to have bad uh, intervertebral discs, but we also have to use some common sense. So those with previously diagnosed disc pathology or concurrent low back pain may indeed be at risk for recurrence or exacerbation. So um, that's his point there. So one of the things that he brought up, have, if you've ever heard this uh, mentioned, an absence of evidence does not imply an evidence of absence. What do you think about that? So although there are no studies specifically implicating abdominal crunches as an etiological cause of a specific person's disc herniation, so that means there are no studies that have directly connected crunches with herniations. Um, he's saying an absence of evidence with a lack of studies does not imply an evidence of absence. So I, I think overall looking at studies, just because you may not be able to find anything in the literature on a certain topic, doesn't necessarily mean that that's an evidence of, of absence. So that just means more studies need to be done. So he goes on, basically taking the same uh, position, um, just a balanced approach. So what he says is a really interesting point. So have you ever considered that back pain is caused by an imbalance between flexors and extensors? So if you're someone that has really strong abdominal muscles, so really strong anterior core and really weak, posterior core, that places you at greater risk for, for low back problems. So the evidence indicates that to be the case. So there's actually normative tables that show uh, evidence that if you have really strong anterior and really, really weak posterior, that you're at greater risk for, for low back problems. So that's what he's saying down here. If an imbalance exists, okay, in other words, you already have really strong abdominals in the front, performing abdominal crunches in the absence of balanced extensor training, so he's saying we need to do more back here to balance it out, would seemingly perpetuate uh, one's risk. So, okay, so the very last one, deep squats. So in much the same way, are deep squats going to give you knee problems? If you already have knee problems, should you do deep squats? Probably not, okay? Are there any sports that require that you be able to do a deep squat? Yeah, so Olympic weightlifting, where do they catch the bar with Olympic weightlifting? They catch it really low, right? So the heavier that bar is, the less you get the bar off the ground and you have to be in that deep squat position to catch it and then you have to be able to stand up with it. So the snatch and clean and jerk are, are great examples of that. So um, a couple, Schoenfeld on the pros again. So I don't know how he gets himself involved with all this, but he's usually the, the first one um, to the benefits or the pros. Anyway, so um, he says, more recent studies have failed to reveal any association between deep squatting and injury risk in healthy subjects. Okay, so we're talking about three parts of the knee joint. So we're talking about the ligaments, okay? So the ACL and the PCL, and then we're talking about the knee joint itself. So what two bones form the knee joint? What's the formal term for the knee joint? That's the other one, okay? So that's the patellofemoral is the, so ligaments, patellofemoral, and then the knee joint is called the tibiofemoral. So when you have patellofemoral, that's, the articulation of the patella with the femur, and then the knee joint itself is the tibiofemoral. So the tibia and the femur articulating together. So first he talks about the ACL and PCL. So I thought this was interesting. So the cruciate ligaments cross in the center of the knee joint. Okay, so the PCL prevents the knee joint from excessive flexion. The ACL prevents the knee joint from hyperextension. So they, they work in opposition, 
mostly at the extremes of the range of motion. So flexion with the PCL, hyperextension with the ACL. So what, what he's saying is pulling from the literature, ACL forces peak between 15 to 30 degrees of flexion. So that's, that's just on the initial descent of a squat. Your knees are just barely unlocking and you're, you're coming down. So decreasing significantly at 60 degrees and leveling off thereafter at higher flex and angles. So it appears that the, the forces on the ACL are actually higher at the upper part of a squat okay, versus the lower. So that would support uh, his argument there. Peak PCL forces are seen approximately 90 degrees and rapidly decline thereafter beyond 120 degrees forces on the PCL are minimal. So part of the reason for that is when you are in a deep squat, when you're in a deep squat, what are your hamstrings are almost resting on the calf muscles, aren't they? So, and he acknowledges that. He says squatting at high flexion angles may have a protective effect on ligamentous structures because the posterior soft tissues, so the hamstrings and the calf are actually, so if you if you squat, so right now my hamstrings are actually resting on my on my calf muscles, which would take a lot of the stress off the, off the PCL. So that's, that's his point. Okay, so let's see. So, and then he goes into what Haley said here with the patellofemoral stress. So that's where he does acknowledge that if you do have any pre-existing knee issues, you might be at risk of uh, making those worse with the patellofemoral joint. So, on the back side of the patella, there's cartilage. On the front of the femur, there's cartilage. And so squatting to a high knee flexion angle might wear down that cartilage. And so that would result in a lot of pain and problems with uh, the patella tracking properly on the femur. Okay, so the other point right here, Williams, um, Williams uh, is a physical therapist, so she's, of course, a good one to take the, the opposing view. So most sports stances require some degree of knee flexion. However, few require flexion in which the top of the thigh is below parallel. Well, I think that's a fair point, right? That's a really good point. So we don't see many sports where athletes are in those deep knee flexion angles. And so she basically says, well, that contradicts one of the primary purposes of using a closed kinetic chain exercise like the squat would be a lack of sports uh, specificity. So then she says, again, what Haley said, patellofemoral compressive forces can stress the articular cartilage on the undersurface of the patella, and that can lead to chondromalacia. So that's just a degeneration of cartilage on the patella and eventually osteoarthritic changes. Uh, so she brings in a really good review from Escamilla. Uh, this is one that I have, and it's a really good one that talks about uh, activity um, in the quadriceps. And the evidence, at least from this review, says that quadricep activity gradually increases as knee flexion increases up to 90 degrees. So that's like a parallel squat. And then little evidence suggests increased activity past parallel. Now, I disagree with right there, little evidence, because there is, if you look at other literature. But um, at least a lot of literature suggests you don't get much activity past that 90 degree point. So I think taking a conservative approach, again, if you have prior knee issues, then you want to be cautious. However, if you really, what, what I feel personally, based on what I've read, and I've read a lot, uh, if you don't have knee issues and you really want to develop your quadriceps, you can squat effectively below parallel, and you're going to get good results. There's research that she didn't point out that shows you jump higher and run faster over time if you do deep squats, and so I, I can show you that side of the argument too. So really, um, my whole intent with this is just there's always going to be two sides to the literature. And I think it's, it's best to read everything and then form your own opinion based, based on your experience. So, do you have any questions?
Okay. All right. So let's let's transition back over to chapter 17. Okay. So what are the current physical activity guidelines for Americans? What are we supposed to be doing? 2018. We got some new guidelines. What are they? How much how many minutes per week of moderate physical activity? 150 minutes. What's moderate intensity? How do we know it's moderate? How do we know that if we're out walking, it's moderate? Conversational pace. Yes, yeah, so it's about three to three and a half miles per hour for a mile and a half every day would be an example. So if we don't have time for 150 minutes, what's the uh, guideline for vigorous physical activity? Yeah, 75 minutes. Okay, so is there anything beyond that? So what did we get in 2007? Yes, how much? Two days. Two days, right. And then if we're listening to the people in Finland, in addition to strength training, what do we do? Balance training, right? Okay, balance training. So looking at relative risk again, um, looking at different behaviors, such as lower extremity strength, muscle strengthening guidelines, physical activity guidelines, moderate to vigorous. What this shows is that if we're meeting just one of those, we gradually have a reduction in risk. If we meet all three, we go from one down to about 25. That's a 75% reduction in uh, risk if we're meeting all three. Now, if we look at each of these individually, meets muscle strengthening guidelines versus not. Okay, so if we are meeting them twice a week, we have just below one, so we have a little bit of risk reduction, like 10% risk reduction. Uh, if we're meeting the vigorous and moderate physical activity guidelines, okay, so either 150 or 75 minutes, we go from one down to about, right, maybe 25% risk reduction, and then if we meet the 75th percentile for lower extremity strength, okay, so we're going from one down to about right there, that's a 50% reduction in risk. So is everybody able to see how I'm saying that, 50% reduction? Okay, so do you have to work hard to get to 75th percentile? Is it more than just going through the motions though? Yeah, yeah, okay. So. It's achievable for everyone, but to get to the 75th percentile for lower extremity strength, that means you're, you're working hard. Okay? It's not just putting on a light weight and doing your, your leg press or whatever you're doing. You've got to push yourself a little bit. And you push yourself a little bit and you get additional uh, reduction in risk. Okay, so Physical activity, a lot of this comes from Blair because I, I got to meet him twice when I was at Arizona State. Um, you would look at him and you wouldn't think that he did any exercise at all. <laughs> so maybe he doesn't, I don't know. He just, maybe he spends all his time in the lab on his computer, but you wouldn't think so. Um, and that's what you, you go to these meetings like the NSCA meeting and the ACSM meeting, you meet these people that are like these incredible scientists that you've read their books and you've read their research and they're never the person that you would expect them to be. Um, I sat by William Kramer once at the NSCA luncheon um, and you'd never know that he even lifted weights. It's, so it's interesting. Um, so protective effects of cardiorespiratory fitness on comorbidities. Hey, what are comorbidities? Yes, so co means that we have things that raise our mortality rate that are occurring together. So like we talked about with metabolic sy syndrome, a cluster of conditions that all has to do with the blood. So blood pressure, blood sugar, waist circumference, cholesterol and triglyceride levels that all increases our risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. So you can see Blair has published a lot more than just on the heart stuff, all this other stuff can be affected by 
having a moderate level of cardiorespiratory fitness. So let's go through some of this. So here's our reference group right here. So that's a relative risk of, of one, right? Okay, so if we're dropping below that, that means reduced risk, right? Okay, so if you look at that, this group right here cuts off right around 10 mets in their cardiorespiratory fitness. So 10 mets is equal to about 35 milliliters per kilogram per minute. All the way up here to 13, which is about 45 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So if we can get right here in this zone, that's where we have reduced mortality risk from diabetes. You can see coming down right here, oh, right there is where we really get that reduction in risk. So uh, this is achievable for everybody. Um, hypertension in women. This was a five-year study. And so over five years, 157 women developed hypertension. Okay, so that's this big yellow bar right here. This is relative risk on the side. So achieving a moderate level of fitness or even a high level of fitness. So categorized as 7.9 to 10.8 mats or greater than 10.9 mats. So just under 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And so you see those with a moderate level of fitness all the way down here, 40% reduction in risk versus the high fitness had almost a 70% reduction in risk. Okay, hypertensive men. I like these graphs because it kind of shows things in three dimensions. So deaths per 10,000, this would be man years or person years here. So looking at someone with a high cardiorespiratory fitness and happens to have high blood pressure right here in this square versus someone that has normal blood, blood pressure less than 140 and low cardiorespiratory fitness, can you see how the risk, the mortality rate is about the same? Okay, so this suggests that fitness is protective. Ideally, we want low blood pressure with high or moderate cardiorespiratory fitness. But this just shows the protective effects of, of maintaining our fitness level. So as we go through this, do you notice that the bar pattern is about the same for all of these? It doesn't matter what it is. Um, metabolic syndrome, it's the same protective effect if you have a moderate or high level of fitness. So going from doing pretty much nothing to doing something is where we get the most benefit. Fibrinogen, how many know what fibrinogen is? Fibrinogen is like glue in your bloodstream. Fibrinogen is a protein that promotes blood clots. So it makes blood cells stick together. So that's another benefit of having good cardiorespiratory fitness is that you have less of this, we call it a clotting factor in your blood. So if you have less of this clotting factor, there's less risk of strokes, right? Because you're not going to be making blood, blood clots that plug up blood vessels. Okay, C-reactive protein. How many have heard of that one? It's, it's an inflammatory factor. Okay, so it promotes inflammation. That, the reason why that's damaging is because it tends to make the interior lining of arteries very fragile. And so if we have this, this, this large-scale inflammatory response, there's greater likelihood that we can damage the inner lining of these arteries. So that's when we have the collection of plaque beginning to develop. So again, what this says is cardiorespiratory fitness helps us have a lower total body inflammation as measured with C-reactive protein. Okay, so cancer. Okay, all of us know someone that's passed away or maybe even has this now. So saying that survival outcomes are a lot better, irrespective of body mass index, when we pay attention to uh, fitness. What about mental health? So 
drug therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy produce remission. What does remission mean? Yeah, getting better, right? Produce remission in approximately 40% of clinically depressed individuals, 40%. Now, that's drug therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, but what if we put exercise in with that? So that might be pretty useful. So that's what this slide is on. Exercise might be a synergist along with drug therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. So it, it even looks like there's a dose response for exercise in remission of depressive symptoms. So the control condition, which was no exercise versus 80 minutes a week, you have 30% of patients with a remission, okay? And then going up to 180 minutes a week. So just above the, the physical activity guideline, 30 minutes over it, and you have, you have almost 40% remission. So exercise alone, at least from this data, is as effective as drug therapy and cognitive therapy, but what if we put them together? So it'd be synergistic and may even produce greater remission. Okay, so class activity for today. What I'd like you to do is click on this link from USA Today, and then on a piece of note paper, I'd like you to jot down just some quick answers to these questions, and then we're going to talk about it. Education is key to longer, happier lives. Our kids and schools need more of it. It's about a five, five minute read or less. Physical activity guidelines for kids are different than for adults.
couple more minutes, finish it up. So there's only two states that require daily physical education, but none of them meet the requirement for time. Uh, Texas and Illinois are the only two that uh, there is daily physical education, but it's it's not um, it doesn't meet the CDC recommendation. But still, two. Are you surprised by some of the findings of that article? How much? How much do schools spend annually for PE? You're poor, isn't it? <laughs> well, what can we do about it? So why is it that kids drop out of 70% uh, of kids drop out of sports by the time they're 13? So how can we change things, do you think? Okay, well, yeah, I think high school comes into play at about that age, ninth grade, I think. Um, so maybe for kids that don't make the school team, there could be more community programs to keep them active. Uh, what about at home? I think a lot of the change comes from home. Guess what I see when I get home every night? I see Nintendo Switch, and I see computer, so we have to encourage physical activity. Okay? I, I find it helps if you actually do exercise with your kids. So if you pull them aside and you're actually doing the activity with your kids, it makes a big difference um, in how they feel about it. And they're, they feel more positive about it if you're doing it with them. So I think a lot of the change has to come from the home. I think the home is the place where you can make uh, the greatest influence on a child before they leave and uh, have those patterns as an adult. So John F. Kennedy in the early 60s made a great uh, statement on physical fitness because at that point there was a study done where European children were compared with kids in the US and guess what the finding was? Kids in the U.S. were really out of shape compared with European kids, was the finding. And so he came out with the, the uh, a nationwide call for physical fitness, um, created the President's Council on Physical Fitness. So let me uh, just play that uh, statement. this opportunity to speak to the people of America about a subject which I believe to be most important, and that is the subject of physical fitness. And I speak not only as president of you, but also as a parent of two children, who I hope will, will grow up with those qualities of vigor and energy, which uh, we identify with the best of America. This should be a matter of concern to us all. A country uh, is as strong, really, as its citizens. And I think that mental and physical health, mental and physical vigor, go hand in hand. I hope that uh, we will not find a day in the United States when all of us are spectators, except for a few who are out on the field. I hope all Americans will be on the field. That is, they will concern themselves with the education of their children, with the physical development of their
their children, the participation in the vigorous life, and then also as their children get older, inculcate into them a desire to maintain that vigor through their normal life. Our citizens are living longer. We want them to participate fully in that longer life. But they can only do so if they give some of their time and some of their effort to maintaining that vitality. This is a subject uh, which should be of interest to us all. And I hope when we have seen the astonishing results which we have seen from our work in a few schools across the country, where we've been able in the short space of two or three months to change the physical habits and strength of our children, that this will spread to every school district in the United States. That all of us will participate in the life around us, and in so doing will be better citizens and happier ones. This is a challenge for us all, children, boys and girls, college students, mothers and fathers, and all of us, I think, should welcome. I hope all of you will join in a great national effort to build a strong and better America through physical effort and through the contributions we can make by the drive and force we bring uh, to our daily lives. Thank you. That was awesome. that somebody had that on tape. Okay, so just to finish out with chapter 17. So what's the economic cost of sedentary lifestyles? Let's talk about it. So data from, somebody actually did a study on this. 142 countries, 93% of the world's population, physical act inactivity costs the world 67.5 billion annually. Uh, this is from direct and indirect costs from loss of productivity. So direct costs of healthcare and indirect costs, mainly in terms of lost productivity associated with the five non-communicable diseases. So those being coronary heart disease, stroke, type two diabetes, breast cancer, and colon cancer. So the direct cost was 54 billion indirect costs from lost productivity, 13.7 billion. Uh, what's really shameful is that the costliest disease was type two diabetes, accounting for 37.6 billion, and the US accounted for about 40% of that total. So not good, it seems like we could be doing better as President Kennedy encouraged us to do. So uh, in summary, I hope from this presentation that you realize how important it is. Physical activity, improving cardiorespiratory fitness to a level that we can, we can all achieve. It doesn't matter who we are. We, we have the time to invest, uh, and it's worth uh, the investment for an improved quality of life and successful aging. So the recommendation, 30 minutes at least of moderate intensity physical activity most days of the week provides key health benefits um, as well. Uh, if, we, if we prefer vigorous activity, that can also provide benefits as, as well as muscle strengthening exercises. Um, so intermittent bouts are also beneficial. So if we don't have time for longer duration, just short bouts also uh, make significant differences in our health. Okay, so do you have any questions or comments? Since I hope that maybe someday you'll be in a in, on a school board where you have the opportunity to vote in favor of uh, increasing physical activity in schools. So I think it's important, and if we're not going in the right direction, I'm hoping that somehow we can change that in our future. So that's part two of class today, and I'd like to go into uh, chapter 18, part eight for the last part of class today. So the very first part of this chapter talks about internal and external validity. Okay, so do you remember the difference between those two, internal versus external validity? Yes, external validity. How generalizable, how we can apply the findings of the research. So let me just fast forward here. Go right to that slide. Fast 
that's the cause and effect stuff. Okay, so here we are. So internal validity. Did, in fact, the experimental treatments make a difference in this specific experimental instance? So in other words, was the research done correctly? Was it properly controlled? So a study with high internal validity is going to be tightly controlled. Everything accounted for in a laboratory setting. So what's the drawback of that then? What's the disadvantage of that? So if everything is under tight control, then it's going to be hard to generalize it, right? So it's very difficult to conduct a study that has strong internal and external validity. So the best approach as advocated in the text is you start with experiments that have high internal, and then gradually over time there's a greater emphasis on field-based research that has more of generalizability to it. So you start with internal and then you work your way to uh, external. Okay, so what are some this, this book uh, outlines nine threats to internal validity. Okay, so I want you to be familiar with all nine of these threats to internal validity. So the first one is history. Okay, so events occurring prior to the experimental period. So the example, if you're looking at the fitness of fifth graders, and you find out that some of them were involved in a, in a youth soccer program. Okay, so that's gonna provide a training effect, right? That's gonna provide a training effect which interferes with the internal validity of your study. <coughs> so they're gonna be doing a lot more training than what you're doing just as part of the intervention. Okay, so the second one is maturation. Okay, these are things that are usually out of the experimenter's control. So how do you separate the effects of the treatment from the effects of just getting older? So you think about that, how kids change. So what if a teacher administers a test at the beginning of the year? So at the beginning of fall, and then again, the same test the following year at the end of spring. Okay, it may not be so much what they did as part of physical education class as just getting older. Okay, so their muscles, their nervous system is more developed. And so it's not necessarily the training that produced the effect, it's just the, the maturation process. Okay, testing. Okay, we get better at things with practice. So uh, the example here of a class of beginners in tennis attempts 24 hand shots, especially if they are beginners. Okay, you teach them how to do a forehand. First time they do that, the outcome may not be great. So then they come back three days later, do it again. Chances are because they've been thinking about it and they've done it once, they're going to get better, not necessarily because of instruction, but just because of practice. So from chapter 11, the intra-class correlation is really important prior to beginning a study. So how is the intra-class correlation different from the inter? Inter is Pearson. Pearson is two different variables, right? Intra is the same variable that is tested multiple times. So I did a study once um, looking at uh, beginning female weight trainers, okay, over 10 weeks. And almost every time we went in to test their strength before we started the study, they got significantly stronger. So we had to test them about five times before things finally started to level off. So within the first couple weeks, what's happening in their body? They weren't lifting weights before, and so all of a sudden you put them on something new, something they've never done before, and almost session to session, they're demonstrating a significant gain in strength. So before you start a study, if it's especially with a group of beginners, you have to allow that learning effect to kind of fizzle out. 
to where you, you get past that to where your measurement is stable. And you can tell if it's stable because you'll want to run what we did with chapter 11. If it's, if it's stable, not significantly different from one time to the next, then you know that it's okay to start your study. Okay, so instrumentation or rating of performance. Um, can different people rate the same performance differently? Yeah, can the same person rate performances differently over time? Yeah. So this is where we get into intra-rater is the same person, okay? Inter-rater is different people. So how do you control for that then? If you were in charge of a, a large-scale research study, how would you ensure that the same person is consistent and different people rate the same performance consistently. So you're in charge. I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but I talked to Dr. Bowman about it. So mm -hmm. Pro grading, because uh, we can track all the all the kids' scores and if there's like significant outliers, they can minimize those outliers. Okay. I'm not sure what the equation was, but we we have that for the science as well. Awesome. And I can see that with the science as well, because there's a lot of different judges from different backgrounds that might rate the same project uh, differently. I think training at the start of the study is really important. So making sure there are guidelines in how you rate performance, maybe having a videotape where they can actually practice rating and you can say, okay, how consistent are we? So it, are different people watching the same video coming up with the same rating of performance. Uh, also controlling for equipment wear and tear. Okay, so making sure your equipment is up to date and able to, to measure uh, re, uh, consistently and, re, and validly. Okay, so statistical regression. So this happens when you're looking at two groups of, of people that are extreme in one characteristic. So say we're, we're measuring a group that's highly fit and a group that's unfit. So this is the tendency for scores over time with repeated testing for the high fit group to go in one direction. So they're gonna test worse and the unfit group to test better. So we're not sure what causes this, but with repeated testing over time, especially with extreme groups, they're going to come more towards the middle. So the unfit will go up, the more fit will come down just a little bit. Okay, so selection bias. Okay, so choosing comparison groups in a non-random manner. So the argument here is that your groups were not uh, equal to begin with. So in other words, you're stacking the deck with one group. You're purposely putting a group of people together that are more likely to respond well to a treatment versus the control group. So of course you're going to find uh, differences. So always present is the rival hypothesis that says any differences found are due to initial selection bias uh, rather than due to the treatment itself. Okay, experiment mortality. How many have already dealt with this one before your research even starts? <laughs> yeah, okay. So life events, okay, life happens. People that agree to come and help you out, maybe they aren't able to anymore. So it's just part of being a researcher. Okay, selection maturation interaction. So if you're looking at two different school districts, one school district, the admittance criteria uh, for the same grade has older kids. The other school district, the admittance criteria for the same grade has younger kids you're gonna run into that maturation interaction again, where of course older kids are gonna have a tendency to perform better. Um, looking at my son's Little League team, okay, you've got, he's in the 10 to 12 age group this year. There's a big difference between some kids in that age group, 10 to 12. So there's a couple of kids that are close to six feet tall and there's other kids that look like they're about half that. They're all 10 to 12 years old. So, I mean, it, it really 
makes a huge difference. So the 12 year olds, they've got really pretty strong arms, you know? Um, so it's, it's interesting over time as, as people get into high school and things, how a lot of the younger ones that, that matured a little more slowly catch up to some of the, some of the ones that matured early. Um, I've seen in high school where um, someone's on varsity when they're in ninth grade in high school and varsity, just really talented and matured early. And then everybody else that was on the ninth grade team, they catch up to about junior year to where they're kind of at the same level as someone that has been on the varsity the whole time. How many of you have ever ran into somebody after high school and they've grown about six inches? Yeah, so people mature at, uh, at obviously different rates. Okay, so expectancy. So this usually is an unconscious effect. So for example, what if a study on a youth soccer team divides participants up into substitutes and starters? Okay, so if you're, if you're in the substitute group, you might perceive that the coach treats you differently. So if you're in the substitute group, you may not feel like what the coach is saying matters as much, or maybe they perceive the coach may show less concern about incorrect practice trials. So maybe unconsciously the coach is giving the starters a little more attention, a little more encouragement, so they're more likely to respond better to uh, the treatment versus the other group. So a lot of times we try not to, but Obviously, if you're in one group or the other, you may perceive some differences in uh, coaching. Okay, so four threats to external validity now. So this is the ability to generalize. Um, reactive or interactive effects from testing. So participants that become sensitive to their results. So you test a group of people and they realize that their fitness levels are low. So what's a person, what are a lot of people likely to do if after the initial assessment, they realize that they're not good? Yeah, some people are going to give greater effort to the more, more effort than they otherwise would if they weren't aware of where they fit in into the normal values. Okay, interaction of selection bias. Okay, so when a group is selected on some characteristic, the treatment would work only on groups closest to the demographic. So the example given here, a drug education program might be effective in changing attitudes of college freshmen towards drug use, but then the same program, the exact same program may not be as effective for third year medical students. So students that understand uh, drugs to a lot greater degree and, and are aware of the appropriate use. Okay, so the third one, reactive effects of exper uh, experimental arrangements. Okay, so in a real world setting, people might respond differently than in a lab setting. How many of you during your experiments are going to provide verbal encouragement? <laughs> <laughs> Should you provide a verbal encouragement? If you're doing a study on muscle strength, can you provide consistent verbal encouragement? If it's a research study, shouldn't the verbal encouragement be consistent? How do you control for that? Okay, I'm gonna say good job only five times, <laughs> right? That's what we call the Hawthorne effect. Hawthorne effect. So refers to the fact that participants' performances change when attention is paid to them and may reduce the ability to generalize the results. So you could look at the flip side of that as well. In a practical setting, do they get verbal encouragement? Yeah, you get a lot of verbal encouragement in a practical setting. So to take the flip side of that, it may increase the generalizability. But if you're, if, you're, if you're doing a study, you have to think about that. What type of verbal encouragement? 
So if it's positive, what kind of positive verbal encouragement? So if you're, if you're, if you're doing a study where you have to go to muscle failure on something, are you gonna grind out those last five repetitions when your legs really hurt? If someone's screaming at you, I probably would, versus if they're just watching, okay? So that's, that's something you have to consider. So in, in all of your research studies, think about that. How, how much are you controlling that and can you be consistent between people? Okay, multiple treatment interferences. This has to do with the order of testing. So if you, if, you're, if you have a poorly designed study where you're always giving one treatment first versus another treatment. So in this case, if you're looking at two different techniques to teach the barbell snatch. How many have done a barbell snatch? So you're going from the floor over, to your, over your head in one motion and then you're, you're dipping underneath the catch. It's one of the most complex, most difficult lifts to learn because essentially you're catching in an overhead squat position in a, in a deep squat if the, if the weight's heavy and then you have to stand up with it. So it's, you have to be really athletic to do it correctly. So there's a lot of progression and work up to do a uh, barbell snatch. So if you're doing a study looking at two different techniques, but you always do one first versus the other, okay, then the first one may interfere with or enhance learning of the other. So your ability to generalize is limited because the order effect. Is, is, it, is it that they just did the first condition or was it the second condition alone that was more effective? Okay. So how do we control these threats to validity? So let's talk about internal validity first and then we'll talk about external validity. So you need to make the experimental and control groups as equal as possible. So the way that you do that is through randomization. Randomization. So we have nice websites that are able to randomize our conditions for us. So the order of conditions is, is, is it random? So there's not an order effect in our, in our results. Um, matched pairs. Okay, so in this example, let's say we're doing a, a study on strength. So you have a very large group of people. You've already tested everybody in, in the group on strength. So you have them listed in, in your Excel file. Everyone's one rep max barbell back squat you have listed. Okay. So with the matched pairs, what you're doing is you're taking the top two and matching them, and then you take the next two and match them, and the next two and match them, and so on, and then you take the pairs, and then you assign one person to the experimental and one group, one person to the control. So like that. So you match them, and then after they're matched, then you randomly assign to either one group or the other. So. This works really, I've used it before with, with squat studies where you have a bunch of people um, and you just take them similar in strength and then you randomly assign to one treatment or, or the other. And that, that works really well because then you know that they're, the groups are equal to begin with and, and they're randomly assigned. Uh, the next one, match group technique. This is not as popular um, because there's a little bit of intentional effort here. So you purposely look over and you think, okay, this person has performed really well, so I'm going to put them over here. This person also performs pretty well, so I'm going to put them over here. So it's, it's not random. It's kind of an intentional assignment to groups uh, based on past performance. So you, you usually, in this case, you know the people beforehand and you have records of what their performance is. And so you're just gonna kind of, okay, well, so-and-so, they're pretty good. And then this person, they're about the same in effort. So you put them over here. So match pairs is, is better than uh, match groups. 
uh, within subjects. A lot of you are doing this type of design. This is where participants serve as their own controls. Okay, so for example, Jordan's study. Okay, so she's doing different types of attentional focus. Okay, so participants don't just do one condition, they do both conditions. Like with Drew's study on clapping push-ups, there's a, there's a control condition, and then they go through the treatment, and then they have the, the post-test. So pre and post experimental designs are, are, are within subjects' designs because they're doing uh, the two different conditions. Okay, so how do we control threats to internal validity? What's a placebo? So Haley, are you going to administer a placebo? In yours, okay. Yeah. Okay, so there's a study going on right now on sodium citrate, right? So Dr. Schaefer was talking to me yesterday about making a placebo. Uh, there's another study going on uh, with energy drinks on blood pressure response and blood glucose response. So we're trying to come up with a placebo that tastes the same and looks the same. So you're coming up with something so the, the participant doesn't know which condition they're getting. So that's a single blind setup. So the participant comes in, they don't know if it's the experimental or control condition. They're drinking something or ingesting something and they don't know whether they're getting the, the caffeinated drink or the placebo drink. Now, there's a drawback with that, okay? If you took the caffeinated drink, would you know it? Would you know if you had caffeine versus no caffeine? Depends on the person, yeah, because some people are really habituated to it, others not so much. I think I know people that don't take in a lot of caffeine that would probably know within about 20 minutes, they would know which one they had. Um, a double blind is where not just the participant, but also the experimenter doesn't know which one they're getting. So single blind is the participant, double blind is, is both the experimenter and participant doesn't know which they're getting. So this helps control what's called the Avis effect, which means if participants know they're in the control group, if you know you're in the control group, right, you're going to try to prove them wrong and try harder a lot of times, okay, so the Avis effect. Um, the textbook goes over a really good example of studies on anabolic steroids and providing a placebo. So could you tell if you were on the, on the anabolic steroid treatment? If it was a long-term study? say 12 weeks, three months. So it's a, it's a, let's say it's a double blind. So the experimenter doesn't know, the participant doesn't know, they're both given oral anabolic steroids. One's a placebo and one's real. If you had a background in weight training, would you be able to tell? I think so. Yeah, so you're stuck at 300 pounds on your bench press forever and then for some mysterious reason all of a sudden it's going up and it's really easy right what are you gonna think i must have got the good stuff right i must have got the the steroid okay so sometimes it's it's really difficult to to hide depending on the on the type of treatment okay so things that despite our best efforts we can't Controlled. So these things remain uncontrolled. Um, one of the big ones here is the halo effect. So this happens a lot with, um, can happen even at the elite level with, say, gymnastics or figure skating, where, or even in the NBA. So how likely are the officials to call traveling on LeBron James? <laughs> no, right? Why would you say that? So that's the halo effect with the officials, right? It's when Raiders seeing a skilled performance in one task 
are likely to rate the participant higher on subsequent tasks regardless of the level of skill displayed. So this, in this case, it would be the halo effect because of previous performance, who he is, reputation, they're just less likely to call it. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're almost there, guys. Thank you. Okay, so controlling threats to external validity. So there's this definition uh, that I want you to learn. Ecological validity, does the setting capture the essence of the real world? So that's when we can generalize is when we design our research to capture the essence of the real world. So what we're concerned with are the type of people that we have in our study, because we want to be able to generalize to the same type of people. The treatments, are the treatments reflective of what they would experience in the real world? Okay, and it's hard to set strength training studies up like that because a lot of times when people go into the gym, they're doing something different every single time. And it's hard to design a study that has a program that's exactly like that. So you wanna try your best though to make it just like they would be doing when they go to the gym. Uh, and the context. So what, what type of environment are they training in? You wanna to try to mimic that to increase generalizability. So overall, um, there's a greater advocate, advocacy for research in field settings. So that's what we do in, in this department. Um, there's some universities where everything is in a lab, everything is tightly controlled. People come in and they get all their meals and sometimes they even live at the facility. Everything we do at, at this university is directly applicable. Level three applied research. So what we're trying to do is increase this ecological validity with the type of projects. And I think that's the best because that really makes the most difference, I think. Um, most, a lot of studies, they just sit on the shelf and collect dust. We want something that's gonna change lives and help people get better. So do you have any questions? Okay. All right, so those that are doing research, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to walk you down to the lab. You can kind of check out the scene and um, we can talk about tomorrow, make things ready to go.